Professor Rajesh Sena to give his talk on cataract surgery in silicon filled eyes. Uh, Professor Rajesh Sena is a consultant at uh, uh, Cornea Cataract and Refractive Surgery Services at RP Center Ames and also the treasurer of All India Ophthalmological Society. Thank you, ma'am. And a very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I'll be uh, talking about cataract surgery in oil-filled eyes. Uh, I have no financial interest. Uh, we all know that uh, these days, the vitreoretinal surgeons have, uh, you know, over the last 10, 15 years, the number of vitreoretinal surgeons have increased, the number of vitreoretinal surgery has increased, and post-VR, uh, cataract formation also is there because of uh, the number of surgeries increasing, there are many risk factors, and some of the factors that are responsible are intraocular gas or silicon oil that uh, is injected that can lead to cataract formation. One can <coughs> directly uh, touch the capsule by instrument, it, they can damage the capsule uh, by instrument, these things can happen. Then there can be progression of senile cataract, diabetics undergoing VR surgery, and then of course, uh, the combination of factors. And uh, there are various challenges when you are handling a uh, cataract uh, in oil-filled eye because the patient has an already undergone a prolonged surgery, VR surgery. Uh, the risk of uh, complications is higher. There's increased risk of post-operative inflammation. There can be emulsified oil in anterior chamber. That can hamper your visualization. You have to modify your procedure. There can be presence of posterior capsular plaque. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, there can be presence of posterior capsular defect. And as it's uh, these VR surgeries are prolonged surgeries, there's risk of, uh, you know, uh, the zonular weakness, zonular damage because of doing extensive vitrectomy. So all these things are there. There can be fluctuating anterior chamber depth because uh, the vitreous support from behind is not there. So there's increased movement of the lens iris diaphragm. Uh, along with that, you can ha also have a breathing pupil. You can have infusion deviation syndrome fluid can migrate posteriorly and that can push the lens iris diaphragm anteriorly. Then you have a tendency to increase <laughs> further in the anterior chamber and that can lead to further increase in, you know, uh, iris coming up and all these things are there. So we should not raise the bottle height. We should not increase the intraocular pressure on uh, uh, any of the FACO machines. We should have a moderate uh, low uh, bottle uh, setting, low IOP setting. And uh, you should also use uh, uh, some uh, um, uh, viscoelastic which contains chondroitin sulfate that can coat the endothelium. So that will you know, prevent some damage to the endothelium. We should plan it well. We should try to figure out the posterior capsular status. And if somebody has shown a very rapid progression of cataract, then in that case, one should delay surgery because rapid progression of cataract means that there is a physical damage to the capsule and that has resulted in rapid progression. So if you do it early, there's a risk of uh, enlargement of that defect. You, you should wait for a couple of months so that the margins of this defect gets fibrosed and then you can go ahead and perform the cataract surgery safely. So uh, and, uh, as far as the procedure is concerned, if you don't have any uh, any oil in anterior chamber, you can go ahead and perform the procedure the way you like. You can do a, uh, your chopping techniques, emulsify the nucleus. Try to see if you have, as in this case, there's a small PC plaque in the mid peripheral part. There is no cleavage plane. You can have normally three types of plaque. Uh, what we notice in these cases of oil filled eyes, there can be plaques which which can which are anterior to the capsule. You can create a cleavage plane. There are plaques which are merged and capsular fibrosis, which you cannot separate. And there are plaques which are seen in the posterior surface of the posterior capsule. So all these uh, possibilities are there. And you can see here at, uh, at the end, it is in the mid periphery. So only in the post-op period, if it is coming in the visual axis, then one can think of removing the plaque uh, during the oil removal. Now, this is a case wherein the plaque is, uh, you know, quite thick and you can create a cleavage plane between the plaque and the posterior capsule. So once you have created the cleavage plane, you can lift it up with the help of a forceps and any utrata forceps, any uh, um, micro forceps, and uh, you can uh, remove the plaque and place the intraocular lens. High viscosity viscoelastic is essential to have a cross uh, uh, opposite side pressure in the anterior chamber on the capsule. 
Now, there can be presence of a posterior capsular defect as in this case. Now, what happens that if it's a, uh, uh, you know, if it's a aqueous, uh, if it's a saline filled vitreous chamber after vitrectomy, then there's rapid progression. But if it's an oil filled, then the progression is not rapid. That's why you could see that the lens was not wide and uh, there was uh, enough glow. And you can now see here that the margins are quite fibrosed and this is the defect. And after removal of the lens fibers, you can see that the oil uh, keeps on coming. So in such a case, it is better to you know, inject viscoelastic from the sideboard before taking out your uh, instrument, place a multi-piece lens, and once you have placed the multi-piece lens, do an optic capture. So even if there is some oil, you can remove it later. But if you have done an optic capture of the IOL, then what happens is that it seals the, the opening. As you can see here, after removal of this uh, oil, no oil is coming in, uh, again. So with the optic capture, you seal the, uh, the defect uh, uh, with the help of the IOL. And if there is emulsified oil in the anterior chamber, you have to remove it. Uh, you just remove it with uh, uh, saline solution and then, of course, go ahead and complete the procedure. Now, femtosecond laser is very much doable in most of these cases. As in this case, there was no oil in anterior chamber. So it is just like uh, it is just like any other case. You can just go ahead and complete the procedure and put the intraocular lens. Uh, I prefer for to put uh, endocapsular ring in most of these cases because there is some degree of zonal deficiency in most of these cases. But some in cases wherein you have oil in the anterior chamber, there is shadowing. And in such a case, you will not get a complete capsulotomy. You will not get a nucleotomy. So only a partial capsulotomy has been done. So in, in such cases, if there is oil in the anterior chamber, I don't advocate use of uh, flax. However, if the patient insists on flax, it becomes a three-step procedure. You have to remove the, uh, the oil from anterior chamber, release this saniki as, as being done in this case, inject high viscosity, viscoelastic, and then go ahead and you can complete the flax. Uh, flax is very much doable. Uh, only thing is the energy required uh, is higher because there's high viscosity, viscoelastic in the anterior chamber instead of aqueous. But uh, if the patient can understand, it is always better to uh, do a manual conventional fecal mastication in such cases instead of making a three-step uh, uh, procedure while doing flax. We just, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we performed a study comparing femtosecond laser-assisted cataract surgery versus conventional fecal mastication in post-vitrectomized eyes. The idea was this: that uh, you know, all these in all these cases, we have compromised the new. So, in uh, while doing capsular exes, you can further, uh, you know, the weak zonules can further get damaged. So, all these procedures can be managed well with flax with in a closed globe, and uh, and these eyes are also uh, having some damage uh, by the previous surgery. So, endothelial cell decompensation or endothelial cell loss may be there. So, flax may help to reduce further endothelial cell damage. That was the rationale uh, uh, of the study. And we found out in the study that the energy required for fecal emulsification was significantly lesser in flax group. And uh, the speckler count was again uh, significantly better, less endothelial cell loss in flax group. Then uh, what we found out that in 40% of eyes where there was no oil in anterior chamber, while doing the uh, capsulotomy, one or two drop, droplets, uh, while doing the capsular excess, one or two droplets or more came into anterior chamber. While, uh, while, while in a flax, you do it all closed globe, so there's no risk. So all these oil bubbles, when they come into anterior chamber, they touch the endothelium and there is more chance of endothelial cell loss. And uh, so in this study, we concluded that uh, uh, flax can be considered uh, uh, to have superiority over conventional fecal emulsification in eyes uh, with uh, previous vitreoretinal surgery. And as far as IOL power calculation is concerned in oil-filled eyes, uh, of course, optical method is the best method using the uh, various uh, good quality formulae that we have. But if we cannot use the optical method, then maybe we can multiply the A scan axial length by 0.71 and we can get a reasonable uh, IOL power. So in conclusion, there are mainly three uh, issues uh, in uh, a case of uh, uh, operated uh, 
vitrectomized eye, you can have a risk of uh, damage to the zoonus. The zoonus can be damaged a little bit. They can be defect, pre-existing defect in the person, or there can be presence of a plaque. So all these things have to be managed while performing cataract surgery in these eyes. It requires a good pre-operative planning, an accurate dial power calculation, and of course, a very careful intraoperative manipulation. So thank you very much for your patient listening. And uh, any suggestion, uh, I'll be happy to 